Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Chapel, where, where we do things, we come together as our authentic selves, and we share what's on our minds, what's on our hearts, and we have such a pleasure today. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Andrew Packman will be leading us today in a riveting, a riveting sermonic a uh, display about seminary and all the things that he's working on, and I am looking forward to it. What a treat. So without further ado, I want to introduce a very respected individual, a very kind individual, and a very not only knowledgeable individual, but just a genuine good person. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. Reverend Dr. Andrew Prackman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki, Chaplain Nikki. And it's good to see you all. I um, I hope among those things that I am, hope all of us are, also includes contemplative. So today I want to reflect a little bit about some of my own thoughts. When Nikki invited me to kind of reflect about whatever or on whatever is on my heart and mind, I've been thinking about this new role as professor of formation here and um what it is we're doing at seminary in the first place. What kind of transformation so does seminary like United occasion for people who are paying us hard earned tuition dollars? What kind of humans do we hope to form here? There are lots of ways to answer this question and the pressure to clarify an answer is only getting more intense. We live in an age of great institutional anxiety local congregations, nonprofits, activist communities, higher ed, all of our constituents are facing existential threats. And this means that they're all facing pressure to rearticulate their mission. That means to justify their existence, to say what kind of value they add to this brave new world. So what is the reason for seminaries like United to exist? What value do we add to the world? What kind of humans come out of places like this? So I want to take a preliminary crack at these questions by zeroing in on one of the most prevalent things we do here, but that is also one of the most, I think, misunderstood things we do. That thing, which is both ubiquitous and mysterious, is thinking. To say that this is a place where thinking happens may not seem that contentious. It's a school, and schools are places of learning, and presumably learning requires that we think. But there are many who view the act of thinking as itself intrinsically suspicious. Some will say that the activity of thinking tends to privilege the mind over the body. And so to say that seminaries about cultivating a certain kind of thinking is to perpetuate the deep dualism between material worlds and the extended things with mass and volume like our bodies and the intellectual world of ideas. Others whose livelihoods are concerned primarily with concrete matters, like declining church attendance or how to dismantle white supremacy, might argue that we don't really need more thinkers in this world. What we need are more doers, practitioners, activists. To focus on thinking then is to choose theory over practice. And this means taking our eye off the ball of the most pressing issues of the day, the things that really deserve our attention. Thinking on this view is a kind of distraction. Others will say that thinking is always too limited, too parochial. To focus our attention on thinking is to privilege a distinctly white, Western, cishet, masculine way of being in the world, one that relies on and exploits the labor of others. Those who philosophized in ancient Greece, after all, were men with enough property and wealth to be citizens. And their capacity to sit around and think big thoughts was predicated on the existence of those without property, those who were not men, those who were not citizens, and those who were neither politically nor materially free, that is, the enslaved. This worry is that to be about the business of thinking is to be in solidarity with these kinds of elites and to therefore be complicit in forms of domination and exploitation that fed, clothed, housed, and otherwise supported these ancient men as they filled our libraries with dusty old books. One last related worry is that focusing on thinking privileges a 
particularly human way of being in the world, and that this distances us from non-human animals and other non-animal forms of life. What's needed now, these critics tell us, is not more thinking, but less, so that we can begin to repair this artificial breach between us and the natural world. And this might require us to cultivate parts of ourselves that we share with non-human creatures, such as living in bodies that pulse with organic processes and living in a way that's reciprocally, reciprocally enmeshed with other forms of interconnected life. So these concerns are all serious ones, I think, and I suspect that they're familiar to many of us at United. But I hasten to note that these critiques of thinking, that it's anti-embodiment, that it's divorced from practice, that it's parochial and facilitates alienation, all of these are themselves critiques that were the product of thinking. We wouldn't know that these were problems, that there were problems with thinking, if there weren't thinkers thinking about the activity of thinking. What's more, while we would be right to want the next generation of religious leaders to be more embodied, more practically skilled, more decolonial, and more humble about our place in the wider web of life, I don't think any of us would want these leaders to be less thoughtful. This all suggests to me that the real problem isn't finally with thinking itself, but with certain kinds of thinking that have proven to be harmful, limited, inhumane, or somehow insufficient. So what kind of thinking, and more accurately, what kinds of thinkers should we strive to nourish in seminary? Here again, there are many other answers. Some will say that we need to cultivate thinkers with a deep knowledge of the various religious and spiritual traditions. We need those who know a lot about the rich tapestry of Christian tradition, or that of Muslim metaphysics, or of Buddhist therapies of the mind, or of pagan conceptions of natural earth-based rhythms. Or perhaps we need thinkers who know a little about all of these traditions and their complex interdependence and the histories um, that interweave with one another so that contemporary practitioners can reimagine them in light of new problems. Others will say that we need to know more about those traditions that have been historically excluded from the center to heed the wisdom of indigenous persons or of black and womanist communities or of queer and trans folk. Despite their differences, all of these kinds of knowing describe forms of theoretical knowledge. That is a knowledge that we have about stuff in the world, people, traditions, perspectives, and in this case, religious and spiritual perspectives, including their critiques. But those worried about the separation of theory and praxis will remind us that it's one thing to know about things, it's another to know how to do things. So alongside theoretical knowledge, religious leaders need practical wisdom. And this comes from the kind of thinking we do in congregational internships and practicums and CPE or other kinds of field work. Religious leaders become practically wise by learning how to conduct power analysis, how to manage a budget for a nonprofit, how to preach a dynamite sermon, or how to interpret the meaning of an ancient text that speaks to the modern world. Clearly, we value these kinds of things and thinking at United. We need to know about the world of religion, and we need to know how to do things with religion to change the world. I agree that they're invaluable, and I wouldn't want us to go without some combination of them. But I don't think that either of these gets to the real nub of seminary thinking. There is another way to think, one that includes and is nourished by certain kinds of theory and praxis, but that is not finally reducible to either. This kind of thinking is what truly sets seminaries apart from other graduate school programs in sociology or religious studies that try to teach us about stuff. And it's also what dif distinguishes us from other professional programs in, say, clinical psychology or nursing or social work that teach us how to do things. So what is this third way? In a word, it's what the ancients and medievals called contemplation. Contemplation is difficult to define. That won't stop me, but it is difficult to try. For one, each contemplative tradition thinks of it a little differently. 
So it might be more accurate to talk about Jewish and Christian and Muslim contemplations. But there is something more fundamentally mysterious about it, something that's intrinsic to contemplation itself that places it beyond the limits of human language and intelligibility. We could say that it has a mystical component in the sense that it is oriented towards a reality that exceeds the ordinary everyday world and the ordinary everyday ways we talk and experience the world. It's a kind of thinking that takes aim not at the finite things that we can touch and feel and see, but at the infinite, that which is fundamentally unbounded and excessive. And for that reason, it overflows and saturates all of our best words and ideas, filling them with a superabundance of reality, flooding them with an excess of meaning. As the theologian David Tracy puts it, contemplating the infinite gives us more to think than we can think. In one especially moving image, the third century Egyptian philosopher, Plotinus of Alexandria, describes the human pursuit of knowledge as part of a much larger process in which reality itself gushes forth from an infinite source and is gradually drawn back like a magnet to the infinite, what he calls the one good. We learn all we can from studying about reality, progressing from disordered matter to an organized cosmos to the soul, and finally to intelligence itself, what he calls nous in Greek. But upon arriving at pure intelligence, what we might think of as a mix of theoretical and practical knowledge, Plotinus finds that there is nothing left to do but wait and watch. See what happens next. He paints this picture of a weary, exhausted knower standing on the shore of an endless, exhaust, inexhaustible ocean with waves gently rolling in and out, the tide gradually rising and falling. To venture out into the depths of reality is beyond the knower's ability. Instead of more striving, instead of more vigorous learning, the weary wanderer has to wait and watch, allowing the waves of infinite reality itself to draw the soul beyond its limits and into the depths or not, but it's not up to us. In other words, contemplation reverses the flow of activity in ordinary thinking. Instead of eagerly and earnestly striving to know things about the world or to learn how to practically change it, contemplation pumps the brakes. It invites us into a more passive and receptive kind of thinking. Its posture isn't one of grasping, but of allowing the universe to fill us up, to resound in our depths. We might think of it as widening the aperture of the soul to let in more light, to submit oneself to those waves of reality that Plotinus calls them, to allow them to stretch us into more than we are. 20th century French mystic Simone Weil, whose uh, countenance is newly hanging in my office, puts it this way. There are some kinds of effort, quote, there are some kinds of effort which defeat their own object. Others are always useful, even if they do not meet with success. In the latter kind, all that I call I has to be passive. Attention alone, the attention which is so full that the I disappears is what's required of me. I have to deprive all that I call I of the light of my attention and turn it on that which cannot be conceived. End quote. The irony here is that Vey describes the disappearance of the I to a certain kind of activity of the I, that there is some self attending to that which cannot be conceived to the infinite that emerges from this interaction. There are multiple eyes within us, she seems to think, and it suggests that there is both an ascetic and a therapeutic dimension to contemplation. The self that clings to the familiar convenience of well-worn conventional thinking 
has to make space for the emerging self that wonders about those more elusive, challenging, and encompassing patterns of interior life. In this way, contemplation is therapeutic, meaning that the very act of doing it changes us, instilling us with new powers, widening the windows of our soul, rendering us more responsive to that pulsating, vibrant life of God. Finally, there's a meditative dimension to this. Rick Rubin, who is the famous music producer, who's worked with everyone from Jay-Z to Slayer to Johnny Cash, writes this in his recent book, uh, the, Creative Act, the Creative Act, which I'm considering for formation class. Quote, when looking for a solution to a creative problem, pay close attention to what's happening around you. Look for clues pointing to new methods or ways to further develop current ideas. A writer might be in a coffee shop working on a scene and unsure what a character is going to say next. A phrase might be overheard in the chatter from across the table that provides a direct answer or at least a glimpse of some possible direction. We receive these types of messages all the time if we remain open to them. These transmissions are subtle, they're, they're ever present, but they're easy to miss. If we aren't looking for clues, they'll pass by us without us ever knowing. Notice connections and consider where they lead." End quote. Ruben is describing a way of being in the world that is deeply attentive and we have to say thoughtful. He is thinking when he's noticing these things and drawing connections. But the way he moves from thought to thought is not strictly lineage, linear or governed by syllogistic logic. It's associational, serendipitous, maybe even revelatory. The world's religions know something about this, of course. Buddhist malas, Catholic rosaries, and prayer labyrinths invite pr practitioners into repetitive, even circular mental processes that don't move from A to B to C. Zen Buddhist cones present practitioners with riddles that don't simply give their truths away. Instead, they force us to pump the brakes on our drive to solve problems. And instead, they open us new spaces, new pathways, and render new dimensions of the infinite newly visible, salient, and compelling. So from this quick sketch of contemplative thinking, thanks to Rick Rubin and Plotinus and Simon Vey, you can already see why this kind of thinking is easy to overlook, to forget. It's difficult, nearly impossible really, to evaluate whether a student or a faculty member for that matter is doing this kind of thinking. It's certainly impossible to quantify it or to find any kind of concrete artifact from the classroom to demonstrate that any of us have cultivated what Friedrich Schleiermacher calls a sense and taste for the infinite. When the accreditors come knocking, they want us to demonstrate that learning is happening here with reference to knowledge, skills, and attitudes. But as we've seen, contemplation isn't reducible to theoretical knowledge or to practical wisdom, or even to a set of positive attitudes towards spiritual practices. It's more elusive. The subject matter of theological education, the point of seminary thinking, is to attend to that which constantly, perpetually slips through our fingers. As Simone Weil reminds us, the moment that we grasp for God, we have already corrupted it, made it into not God, an idol. The only appropriate stance is to wait for God, to adopt a stance of contemplation, to wait expectantly, to prepare earnestly for the infinite to give us more to think than we can think. This is not to say that we shouldn't strive to keep our creditors happy, we should. Nor am I saying that we should all stop studying the history of modern theology or interreligious approaches to chaplaincy or black and womanist theologies. In fact, we need to study these things. Nor am I saying that we can do away with all the rigorous and sometimes tedious business of reading closely and interpreting carefully and proposing persuasive, well-formed logical arguments. We have to do all these things or else we stop being sure that we're not just dreaming some of this stuff up. But we should do all of this, I think, in view of the larger purpose of seminary. 
namely to provoke contemplation in a world that does everything it can to avoid it and to form human beings who inhabit contemplative thinking as a way of life. All of the knowledge we get, the practical wisdom we cultivate serves this higher calling of transforming our powers of attention and perception and that make us ultimately more responsive to and more attuned to the infinite, to that which slips through our fingers. Amen. Oh, that's going to be really fun to rewatch. watch <laughs> oh, friends. Thank you so much for being here in chapel today. Next week, we're going to have Ronnie, our director of admissions, lead us in chapel. So very excited to see what um, she's willing, what she's going to say and, and how it's going to bless us as a community. Uh, will you join me in prayer? Beloved, gracious one, we are so thankful for this day. We're thankful for community. We're thankful to be able to come back together. We thank you for your beloved child, Andrew, as he shares with us the purpose of seminary and shares with us, shared with us the power of contemplation. Lord God, we ask for these words, the meditations of our hearts, and the deep thoughts to continue to um, uh, continue to come to us and continue to help us to be inspired. We ask this in the many names that you have, blessing us and blessing the world. It is finished. Amen and ashe. Amen. Thank y'all for being here. Chapel is officially paused. No, paused. Pause until next week when Ronnie will be leading us. Y'all have a great and blessed day. Thank you. <laughs> yes.